I am delighted to be here. There is a fort, and we call it the United States of America. Will the fires endanger the fort? That's what I'd like to address today. If we ponder for a moment on Benjamin Franklin's experience toward the end of the Constitutional Convention, as recorded in the notes of the Federal Convention, Franklin observed he had seen George Washington's chair, and on the back of the chair was a son, in fact, only a half of a son. And at the end of the convention, he made the remark to another person, I've long wondered whether that was a rising sun or a setting sun. I have come to the conclusion it is a rising sun. Now take a look at this. Is that a rising sun or a setting sun? This is, this is a brand new creation that Bert Smith made possible for this convention. 10,000 of them, only 9,999 are left. I saw someone buy one. Is that a rising or a setting sun? Franklin in 1780, 1787 said it's a rising sun. I'd like to read a few lines from this book to introduce what we're talking about today. We have not followed the admonition of our founding fathers. A people must from time to time refresh themselves at the wellspring of their origin, lest they perish. I would like to go back to the wellspring of our origin today in the few minutes that I share with you, lest the, we perish. I was going to say lest the fort burn down. <laughs> I've selected a few illustrations from a talk we present that we generally call the three foundings of America. This, however, is something on the back table I'm going to insert. What are we doing at the National Center for Constitutional Studies? This is one of our activities. Recently, well, during the past year, as I understand, we've shipped out about 300,000 pocket constitutions and DVDs, A More Perfect Union. It's back on the table. We have this year, this month, in fact, we have the goal of shipping out 100,000 packets with the Constitution booklet and the DVD, A More Perfect Union, in this envelope. Notice the name Public Law 108477 mandates schools celebrate Constitution Day. Now, as unconstitutional as that is, it's still a law we would like to offer them a product with which they may comply. And so it's exciting for me to know that we're about to send out 100,000. I think that covers all the schools that are uh, middle schools and upper, uh, the, the high schools. And so that's an exciting project. That's one of the things that we're doing. Let's uh, get down to the nitty gritty of this, though. Some people ask me, what should we do? And I say, you can't really answer that question until you ask, who are we? Where did we come from as a people? Then maybe we can answer the question, what should we do? And so we're going to go back here historically and we're going to talk about who are we. To do that, we have to have a prologue. America didn't start in, on July the 4th, like the, the song says, you know, born on the 4th of July. That's not when America started. It didn't start with the Declaration of Independence. Those men didn't ride out of nowhere and create it out of their, their, you know, out of nothing, the ideas that founded this great nation. To understand the origin of America, we have to go back 2,000 years. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. And he was about his father's business. And he ordained twelve that they should be with him, and that he might send them forth to preach. Wicked men cried, Crucify him! Crucify him! Following his death and resurrection, vile men persecuted and tormented and killed his apostles and many of his followers. With the loss of the apostles, the organization of the Church of Jesus Christ crumbled, and a long night of spiritual darkness began, known to historians and to us as the Dark Ages. A ray of light shone 
the spiritual powers have not only been corrupted in sin, but absolutely destroyed. I simply say that Christianity has ceased to exist among those who should have preserved it. Other reformers came forth, each one worth, worth, worth reading an entire book about. Other reformers echoed the same sentiments as these rays of light began to come forth. John Wesley wrote, The Christians had no more of the Spirit of Christ than the other heathens. William Tyndall desired that his people read the Bible in English. He translated the Bible into English. He worked through and saw that it was printed in English. And for a his, as his reward for this, he was betrayed, hunted down, strangled, and burned at the stake. Thousands of the Bibles that he was instrumental in creating were gathered by the dominant church of the old world and tossed into the flames. Now this is all history. This is American history. Because those people that were being persecuted and tormented got into a boat and fled to America. This is where the story of America begins. The first founding of America. And we must begin the story in 1620 and it goes until 1789. These humble Christians landed at Plymouth Colony and began to plant the seeds of liberty. For the glory of God and the preservation and advancement of the Christian faith, they declared, our pilgrim forebears served the God of this land, who is Jesus Christ. One of the early laws that I enjoy reading, quite the whole detail of the law is quite enjoyable, was when they decided that they needed to teach the children to read so they could avoid being deluded by Satan. And so they passed the old deluder Satan Act of 1647. The pilgrims were followed by thousands of Puritans, again fleeing to the New World to try and find a place where they could worship God according to the dictates of their own conscience. During this period of time we call the first founding, several major steps of progress were made. Thirteen colonies became the United States. But notice United is lowercase u. It was not the United States. It was 13 colonies who had united in an effort to gain their freedom from the oppression of the old world. They declared their individual sovereignty. Each new state wrote their own constitution. They were individual entities. The Union grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon it. A plan of federal government was conceived. The Northwest Ordinance of 1787 urged religion and morality and knowledge being necessary to good government be taught in our schools. When you read the rest of that sentence. We organized and created the Constitution that we have today, the Constitution of 1787. A voluntary union was formed by granting a few specific and enumerated powers to the federal government while each state retained its individual sovereignty and right to secede. Our constitutional public republic was founded. Now that's a brief summary of a great period of history looking back to our origins. Others spoke of our system of government. This is one example. Sir William Gladstone of England described the constitutional system as the most wonderful work ever struck off at a given time by the brain and purpose of man. Now, our system did not start on July the 4th. If we look at American history, we realize, we should realize, it started much earlier. These are some of the great building blocks that gave us the freedom program we call the Constitution of the United States. Consider the influence of the Mayflower Compact, the Fundamental Orders of Connecticut, Body of Liberties of Massachusetts Bay, the Virginia Declaration of Rights, then the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States. These building blocks contained constants, constants, things that we find in each one of them that became the foundation of America. One of those constants is you cannot have freedom without a virtuous people. 
You must follow the principles of biblical morality. Be able to distinguish right from wrong. The Sermon on the Mount, the Ten Commandments, the Golden Rule, these basic fundamentals of how human beings interact with one another. Natural law was another fundamental principle common to each of these building blocks. The laws of nature and of nature's God, the higher law. These are some of the uses of the term that come from the natural law. Another important ingredient was deliberation. They gathered together and they deliberated to try and solve their problems. Deliberation under God from a virtuous people can solve problems. In fact, I think it can solve all the problems with regard to human relationships. And finally, they chose representative assemblies to deal with their problems. These were common constants in the building of the union. From this, and these are my words, no great philosopher or psychologist or professor of anything wrote these down. I wrote them down from my reading of history. A national policy of the union of sovereign states began to develop. Strive to achieve and advance self-government by a virtuous people deliberating under God to establish a representative legislative assembly. From the solemn act of deliberation before God, the assembly shall strive to pass just laws for the general good that apply equally to all citizens. A constitution of limited and defined powers derived from natural law and overseen by legislative supremacy shall be the supreme law of the land. This could well summarize the national policy of the Union. Alexis de Tocqueville visited America in the 1830s. He wrote a glowing report of what he saw. He also wrote a somber warning. If there's time, I'll present that a little later. And then we come to the second founding. No one's heard of this. Who talks of the second founding? I caught the title of a book one day. I saw that title, and that captivated me. The name of the book was The Second Founding. It was a report on what happened in the city of New York during this period of time from 1861 to 1878. And it struck me that the things that took place in America during this time period were so dramatic that it was literally a second founding. It started, and we don't have time to give much detail, it started here. Maintain the Union at any cost. Now, if you think of the magnitude of that statement, this is what had to happen to maintain the Union at any cost. Abandon the Constitution and the Union of Sovereign States as it was. Now, and by the way, what happened up here on the title? National policy of what? The Union? No, they cast out the national policy of the Union. We now had a new nation. Catch the terminology here. When Abraham Lincoln gave the Gettysburg Address, he said, this is the new nation, not the Union, and then emphasized it five times. A new nation is born. The new nation had this national policy. Create a new nation with an all-powerful central government obliterating the sovereignty of the states. Crush southern independence by force of arms. Elevate the executive branch to an imperial presidency. Accept that the love of money and dominion is worth preserving the union at any cost. If you'll examine your history, I believe you'll agree that these had to be the fundamental national policy of this group that declared they were creating a new nation. Now here's an interesting piece of artwork I dearly enjoy and had a great visit with Dan yesterday about engravings. This was created by the great artist Thomas Nast, well known during this time period. He was trying to depict how Satan influences people. Now although I don't suppose that's how Satan really looks, he's done a grand job of illustrating a, a rather devious character influencing someone else. Satan deceives, if he deceives enough people, he can deceive an entire nation. And we're in that process right now. Smooth talk from prominent men is deceiving the entire nation. Amen. Republican Representative Thaddeus Stevens was one of the men who led the movement to the new nation. Here's what he had to say about the previous system. The Constitution is a worthless bit of old parchment. He was supported by many others just like him. Our philosophy that there let there be no compromise until every breathing soul who holds to the old American principles of constitutionalism 
ceases to breathe. Can you say it any stronger than that? The second founders. We all know the first founders, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin. There was a group of, there, there was a group of second founders. Some of their names are listed here. And many more. Some of the more were the Committee of Fifteen that called themselves the Joint Committee on Reconstruction. They were not supporting the original intent of sovereign states, a union. They were after something quite different than that. Now, every time I give a lecture and say anything about this, I always have people come up afterwards and they say, Oh, but the, the war between the states saved the union. Did the war between the states save the union? No way, it didn't. It destroyed the Union. If you think about what was the Union, is the Union a geographical border? Or is the Union an ideology of sovereign states coming together and creating a federal government and then delegating to that federal government a few defined powers and then they go back and run their states as sovereign entities? That was the Union that was established by our founding fathers in 1787. Did the Civil War, as it's called today, the war between the states, the war of northern aggression, did that save the Union? I'm sorry, the answer is no. And then we redefine once again as review. H.L. Mencken said this of this event. The American people, North and South, went into the war as citizens of their respective states. They came out subjects of the United States, and what they thus lost they have never got back. Did the Emancipation Proclamation free the slaves? These are things that are misunderstood. These are myths that are passed on in each high school in America. Oh, they say it freed the slaves. That's nonsense. Couldn't be further from the truth. Lincoln said this was his last card. His last card in trying to crush the South was Emancipation Proclamation. Could you publish this cartoon in America? No way. It was published in, in Europe, in England. Because if you published this in the northern states, you would have been thrown in jail as the editor of the newspaper. And likely your newspaper would have been crushed by a mob. Oh, this is not talked about much today. This is a bit of our history we haven't reviewed lately. A long train of abuses began. The U.S. Department of Education was established unconstitutionally. Thousands of regulatory actions came from the Interstate Commerce Commission. Groups of prominent men began demonizing the Constitution. One of the candidates these prominent men found and selected and promoted for presidency was Woodrow Wilson. He gathered with him another prominent man, Edward Mandel House. And Woodrow Wilson said of Mandel House, his thinking and my thinking are one. Mandel House wrote a political tract in the form of a novel describing how to have the great society. In this novel, Mandel House announced that their thinking was one, socialism as dreamed of by Karl Marx. If this is going too fast, go to libertyandlearning.com. In two weeks, we should have the whole program on there. <laughs> Are you having fun yet? No, this is heavy stuff. I'm sorry, it's just heavy stuff. But let's wade through it. This is, our, this is our problem that we have to deal with. Where did we come from? Who are we? Now then we can decide what to do. Well, Woodrow Wilson campaigned for his second term of presidency on the slogan, I kept you out of war. And as soon as he was elected the second time, he hired Mr. Creel to be a propaganda specialist, and Mr. Creel hired 75,000 additional propaganda specialists to promote American citizens to think that it was a great idea to go into the First World War. This is another bit of our history we don't talk about. Make the world safe for democracy was the purpose. Or fight the war that would end all wars. <laughs> Socialism as dreamed of by Karl Marx. It would pay us to go back to the Communist Manifesto. Do any of your book tables have one for sale? Dan, have you got any for sale? No. It would pay us to review the viewpoint of the enemy. Karl Marx taught in the Communist Manifesto that democracy is the first step to socialism. Last year, the President of the United States and the House of Representatives were urging us to have spread democracy throughout the world. That's like saying, let's spread socialism throughout the world and pay for it with United States tax dollars. There are two ways to achieve socialism. One is revolution, the other is evolution. 
We're now in the evolutionary process. This picture is an actual photograph of a window in Surrey, England, created by the Fabian Socialist in 1910, sent to me as a gift after I gave a lecture like this in Texas. A member of the state school board sent it to me, said he didn't believe what I had to say, so he called a friend in England, and they went and examined, and they took the picture, said thank you for the lecture. <laughs> so that's where this picture came from. So in Surrey, England, we can see this beautiful stained glass window honoring the socialist movement. Here's a line drawing of that picture. At the top, we can see the slogan, remold it nearer to the heart's desire. Now I earn my living as a blacksmith. I pound on iron. These men are pounding on the world. They've heated it in, an an, uh, in a forge. The man over on the left is pulling on a rope and, and pushing air through the, through the coke to heat the forge. That's an anvil underneath the world, and they're beating on the world, and they're going to remold it nearer to what? Their heart's desire. Hammer stoutly, oh, pray devoutly, hammer stoutly. <laughs> and all these folks are down at the bottom are praying. What do you suppose they're praying to? They're praying at an altar of socialist literature. And the bottom book on the altar is Fabian Tracks and Essays. Now I've read Fabian Tracks and Essays. Long time ago, I gleaned from that some of the high points of socialism. What is socialism? I think if you stop the average American on the street, they would say, oh no, we don't want socialism. We want what we have, a free America. <laughs> May I summarize what I found many years ago written before 1910. This is from the 1800s, this doctrine, coming from the old world, something our forebears ran away from and tried to get away from. Government ownership or control of all land, and you've never heard a better presentation, I haven't, than I heard this morning on this issue. Federal ownership of Nevada. The second major principle, government ownership or control, and control is the key word. Control the major industries. Control labor. Control transportation and communications. Control the credit. Each of these is worth at least an hour. And we do a presentation, we do a whole workshop where we give them all an hour. Government control of all insurance. We don't want socialism, just keep sending my, my Social Security check and my Medicare and my workman's compensation, just keep those up, but I don't want socialism. Government control of the educational system, thank these wonderful people for their contribution. Elimination of the significance of the family. This is Satan's program. Crush the American family and replace it with these weird things that we've been learning about, these brush fires. Elimination of the significance of religion as they wheel the Ten Commandments off of public property and fire Judge Roy Moore. Establishment of the minimum wage. It was only a few weeks ago that Walmart was lobbying for a minimum wage. I thought that was really thoughtful of them. You know, if they raise the minimum wage, then Walmart can pay their, their employees more. Not a great idea? Here's one of the, the senators lobbying for a minimum wage. We all know this gentleman. What do you mean, gentlemen? I wondered when I said that. <laughs> a universal system of pensions. This happened a long time ago. The President of the United States is signing the Social Security Act. Justified use of force if necessary to attain these socialistic goals. If you don't like it, we'll force you at the point of a bayonet, just as they started forcing the goals upon the people in the South during the war between the states. At the point of a bayonet, they created a new nation. The central bank and money are a part of the socialist program. That was created in 1913, actually conceived in 1910. There's an excellent book over here. If there isn't, there ought to be. Who has the book that tells the story? The Creature from Jekyll Island. <laughs> you got it over there somewhere? No. You need, somebody needs to sell The Creature from Jekyll Island. That's a, that's a great book. I have that in that That stuff is in my tradition. Okay. <laughs> we'll click them on here. This is socialism. Now, to the average American, I think this comes as a surprise. It doesn't come to you as a surprise because you're not average. <laughs> You're way, way, way special that you're interested in a topic like this to even come to a conference. This is socialism by their own definition. 
I want to read the words of Alexis de Tocqueville. He wrote, I seek to trace the novel features under which despotism may appear in the world. The first thing that strikes the observation is an innumerable multitude of men, all equal and all alike, incessantly endeavoring to procure the petty and paltry pleasures with which they glut their lives. I really like that. I thought it was quite poetic. He goes on. Above this race of men stands an immense and tutelary power, the government, which takes upon itself alone to secure their gratifications and to watch over their fate. Thus, it every day renders the exercise of the free agency of man less useful and less frequent. The will of man is not shattered, but softened, bent, and guided. Men are seldom forced by it to act, but they are constantly restrained from acting. Such a power extinguishes and stupefies a people till each nation is reduced to be nothing better than a flock of timid and industrious animals of which the government is a chaperon. And to the degree that we allow ourselves to be entangled in its tentacles, we will cut ourselves off from the spirit of the Lord. That was his belief, and it's mine also. In that stained glass window, if we look in the background, we see the coat of arms. This is the coat of arms of Fabian Socialism. That's what the FS stands for. And in this coat of arms, they depict clearly their method of achieving the goals, like a wolf in a sheepskin. And we heard that this morning, how they hijacked a program, a perfectly decent program. They hijacked it and they perverted it to take us down the road to socialism. There's another symbol that was mentioned yesterday, but they need to see, you need to see what the head is, the head of the turtle. Now they call us a tortoise. This is the former president of France, Valerie Giscard d'Estaing. He's placing the tortoise with a dragon's head on the table in front of the European Union members that are planning the next events. They're describing and detailing out the Constitution for the European Union. You need to see that their tortoise has a dragon's head. The third founding began in 1945. It hasn't been completed yet. Some of the founding fathers are right on this picture. On the left we have V. M. Molotov, top henchman of Stalin. On the right we see Harry Truman with one of his henchmen, Alger Hiss. There were other founding fathers of the third founding. Alger Hiss was the head of the Office of Special Political Affairs. Lachlan Curry, the President's Senior Administrative Assistant. Lawrence Dugan, the Chief of the State Department's South American Division. Harry Dexter White, Assistant Secretary of the Treasury. Owen Latimer, and hundreds more. Now you remember a few years ago, and it's still going on, people are shaking their finger and telling us how bad a guy Joseph McCarthy was. You ever heard any comments on how negative and bad Joseph McCarthy is? Well, you found a communist under every bush, was the statement they used to make. And they're still saying it, in spite of the fact that in 1995, the Vernona Papers were opened up for public scrutiny, and scholars found the names of 329 communists in the Roosevelt administration by name. Woo! How many didn't they find the name of? This, this is our history. We are now in the third founding. They have an international policy. It's very simple. No longer a national policy. Now it's an international policy. Establish a world government that gradually will be empowered and transformed into a global socialist dictatorship. Last year, 2005, we had House Resolution 2745, promoted by Tom DeLay and other dignitaries. These were the goals, we were told, of the United Nations. Prevent wars, protect human rights, and advance the cause of human freedom. These were the goals published in the newspapers reporting on what Tom DeLay and other Republicans and Democrats were promoting in Washington. I want to give you the real goals of the United Nations. We down to 10? Okay. We'll go through these real goals and then I'm going to wrap it up. Maybe you don't want to know the real goals. We better do the real goals. Here they are. Strip the United States of its gold reserves. Now just ponder 
How many of these goals have they accomplished? Build up the industrial capacities of other nations at the expense of the United States. Remove the markets from the American producers. Entwine America's affairs with those of other nations so that the United States can no longer act independently. Put an end to U.S. sovereignty and independence. Submerge the United States in a one-world government. Disarm all nations and individuals under a program of human security. Replace the Christian religion with karmic energy, whatever that is, radiating from the UN's Society for Enlightenment and Transformation. I'm told it is in, it's in the basement so that the radiation can go upwards. <laughs> This includes eschewing biblical traditions and building on the Gia hypothesis. Does any of that language sound familiar? Robert Bork summarized well. We're not, I want to catch one more picture here. In his book in 2003, he said the Constitution is gone. These are modern founders. Let's get down to this last picture. Proclaim liberty throughout all the land. Now we have a duty to perform. We have a duty to perform to conquer the enemy of all righteousness. Proclaim liberty throughout all the land. If a nation expects to be ignorant and free, it expects what never was and never will be. Now we go back. Is this a rising sun or is it a setting sun? In Benjamin Franklin's day it was rising. I fear that if Franklin were here today and he were to review what we are doing in America, he may change his mind he may say, well, it looks like a setting sun to me. Now, it doesn't have to be that way. This particular little book we just put out is the great ideas that change the, could change the world, that could change it from a setting sun to a rising sun. It's going back and reviewing our past, our heritage. Now, I want to close. Did you give me 10 minutes? Okay, I'm done now. I'm going to take my 10 right here. <laughs> this, this may only take eight. There are two things I still want to share. One of the great events in American history was the gathering of delegates determining whether they should sign the Declaration of Independence. Wow, what a momentous decision. They had spent 15 years of trying to deliberate with England, urging and writing Olive Branch petitions, letters of, uh, of appeal to the Parliament and an appeal to the King to consider their rights as Englishmen. And finally they were gathered together on this momentous, what became a momentous occasion. And once again they were debating this, what should we do? Timid men urged caution, and others urged reconciliation. John Adams was bored. He'd heard this conversation so many times. He took the floor and pointed his finger at the presiding officer, who was John Hancock. He said, we don't know what he said. <laughs> because nobody wrote it down. <laughs> but you know, years passed by and Daniel Webster wrote the proposed speech of John Adams. Now, unlikely that it was too accurate, but nevertheless, some of it was, because I've also found in my his historical reading, I found bits and pieces of the proposed speech of John Adams in the actual writings of John Adams and others. So I'm going to give you the proposed speech of John Adams because it's a stirring speech and children used to read it in the sixth grade in the McGuffey Readers. That's where I first read it. Pointing his finger at the presiding officer, John Hancock, he said, sink or swim, live or die, survive or perish, I give my hand and my heart to this work. There is a divinity which shapes our ends. You and I may indeed rue it. We may not live to see the day when this declaration shall be made good. We may die. Die colonists. Die slaves. Die it may be ignominiously and on the scaffold. Be it so, be it so. If it be the pleasure of heaven that this poor servant shall give the offering of his life, the victim shall be ready. But while I do live, let me have a country or at least the hope of a country, and let it be a free country. But whatever may be our fate, be assured that this declaration will stand. It may cost treasure and it may cost blood, but it will stand. 
Through the thick gloom of the present, I see the brightness of the future as the sun in heaven. We shall make this a glorious and immortal day. On its annual return, our children will shed tears, not of subjection and slavery, but tears of exaltation, gratitude, and joy. Sir, before God, I believe the hour is come. My judgment approves this measure, and my whole heart is in it. All that I have, all that I am, I am now ready to stake upon it. And I leave off as I began. That sink or swim, live or die, survive or perish, I am for the Declaration of Independence. It is my living sentiment, and by the grace of God it shall be my dying sentiment. Independence now, and independence forever. It was so stirring that Thomas Jefferson wrote about the talk later, and he said the words of John Adams raised us from our seats. Whatever he said, it stirred them to where they agreed to sign and pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor to promoting freedom throughout the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. What are we willing to pledge? I'd like to close with a prayer. I know that's unusual. I had this wonderful experience a few years ago. I taught a conference in, I think it was some far off forlorn state like South Dakota. Anybody here from South Dakota? I, I was up there a few weeks ago and it was a wonderful experience with 106 good people. Hardly anyone up there I knew and never, I only one of them I'd ever met. And by the time we were done, it was a gorgeous, wonderful bonding of love and relationship. So here I was a few years ago in this far off location, far from home. We had taught this 18-hour course called The Miracle of America, a stirring course on the history of our nation, the greatness of our founding fathers, the greatness of the principles on which we're founded. The chairman of the conference became my friend, and he took me to the airport, and there was a bonding between us. He wasn't of my faith, and that didn't matter to me. I loved the man. don't even know what faith he belonged to. I just knew that he loved God and Jesus Christ. And so... Standing in this busy international airport, if they have one in South Dakota, we're bumping shoulders with other people, walking back and forth in the PA system, blaring out. And he says to me, we'll probably never meet again. Please join me in a conversational prayer. And he began to talk as if God were standing there with us. And that was a very stirring moment in my life, and so I would like to share with you some of the thoughts from what I would call a conversational prayer and hope that our Father in Heaven will be able to share and be present in His Spirit with us. We the people gathered in this Freedom 21 conference here in Kentucky, dear God, gratefully acknowledge the blessings of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as Creator, Preserver, and Ruler of the universe and of these United States. We hereby appeal to him for mercy, aid, comfort, guidance, and the protection of his providence as we work to restore and preserve these United States. Our great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians, not on religions, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. For this very reason, peoples of other faiths have been and are afforded asylum, prosperity, and freedom of worship here. America is a choice land, and whatsoever nation shall possess it shall be free from bondage and from captivity and from all other nations under heaven, if they will but serve the God of the land, who is Jesus Christ. America needs men and women of great moral courage to become involved in the political process. But moral courage of itself is not enough. We need men and women of moral courage who have prepared themselves with a working knowledge of the principles and practices of freedom. A 
as defined in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States, according to its original intent. We do not have the luxury of retiring to our own private cloisters to pursue only our own private special interest. Strong voices are needed, the voices of those who have prepared themselves with the working knowledge of our organic documents of freedom. The weight of the stance we take may be sufficient to tip the scales in favor of truth and right. Dear God, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Wonderful, wonderful presentation.